Your Steve Jones Show podcast is loading now. The Steve Jones Show podcast is sponsored by Sunbury Motors, North 4th Street in Sunbury, and Sunbury Motors Kia, routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf. Sports talk where your voice counts. This is the Steve Jones Show on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Now from the Sunbury Motor Studio, here's Steve Jones. I mean, it could be worse. You could have watched a Ben Franklin documentary during the uh, national championship game last night. Yeah, that'd be a total violation. We we know somebody who did that. <laughs> yes, I, I was talking to that someone today, and I just did a bout face as my approval of that let me put it to you this way that person is allowed to make an error in judgment once in a while out of a mistake that is correct right others i would just go after them all right so, <laughs> but not that person all right today's show brought to you by sunbury motors 4th street and sunbury sunbury motors key routes 11 and 15 hummels wharf and online at sunburymotors.com so let's quickly review where we stand today. Uh, Brian Tripp, great job on the Frozen Four, then talking about Penn State baseball. Penn State baseball host Bucknell tomorrow, by the way, at 6. Uh, now, and then Tiger Woods is coming back to play. Matt hates it. It's, it's wrong for life. It's wrong for sports. It's wrong for the Masters. And it really is destructive to Matt's well-being. No, senor! No, senor! No, senor! Yet on the positive side, we're happy that we traded away a first-round pick, swapped another first-round pick, got a first-round pick next year, got a third-round pick, and it is the steal of the century. And then somebody pointed out there are no names yet attached to it, and somebody, nobody knows. And then, we, and, and then we got mad. And we have now spent the last hour just being mad. Now, how mad do I sound on the show? Never. Once again, Mr. 45 heart rate. I'm just saying. (laughs) I, you know. And if the Giants made the trade, I said, okay, well, now they get a chance to, to fill multiple whatever with it. You know? And, but you don't declare victory without knowing who you got. I mean, you just don't know. I mean, for all you know, you draft Ryan Leaf. Get the lingerie on the deck. Call the janitor. <laughs> By the way, Raph was great last night. Oh. He was great. He was great. All right. Play by play call of the day. Oh, oh a settle. Way outside. A settle. Ball tipped around. Kevin and got it back. Nine seconds to go. Johnson was back out here. Short with the shot. Man, it kicks to the corner and throws it away. Abaji sprint to the ball. Harris. I said. Moves out of bounds. Ball screen kick would get him. All right, Gene. We see this right here, and what are the officials over there reviewing? Right now, they're looking at the seconds, uh, naturally, Jim. So now we've got a re- you know, possession, and that first foot lands out of bounds. So they have to take something off, and I'm, I think we're looking at tenths of a second. And here we go. Manic circling around. He slipped underneath. They go to Love. Love's going to be the one to take it. Puts up the shot. It's off. The game is over, and Kansas completes the biggest championship comeback. All time. How many minutes did North Carolina lead in the game? I'm trying to do the quick math here. Had to, had to be a good. F- the, show, the show's over at five. <laughs> it had to be somewhere between 25 and 30. Okay. 18 minutes and 32 seconds. Okay. How many minutes did Kansas lead? Well, the final seconds was 7.9 or whatever it was, 
meditation. 18 minutes, 18 minutes and 32 seconds. Oh. How about that? I see what you did North there. Carol- North Carolina, no. North Carolina led for 18 minutes and wow. 32 seconds. Kansas led for 18 minutes and 32 seconds. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Amazing. That really is. That explains the tournament right there. Yeah. Wow. The whole thing. By the way, uh, very quickly before we get to Neil Kulon, Kurt Menefee, Joel Klatt will be the Fox number one team for the USFL. And Joe Davis, what a great choice. Joe Davis is going to call the primary lead baseball announcer for Fox, including the World Series. Joe Davis is a, gr- a great guy. He is an outstanding announcer. Yes, that that's exactly where I thought they would go, and that was a smart move. I love Joe Davis, football and baseball. You'd love to meet him. He is a great guy, very humble, down-to-earth dude. And Nothing he's used to good. filling big shoes. Goes from no, filling in for the, Vince Scully, now he's going to fill Joe Buck on the World Series yeah. call. He can do it. See? I think this is, this is where you are, because, I mean, you know, this will be my last show today, and you get to fill in the rest of the time. Get the lingerie on the deck. Call the janitor. You seem pretty happy. <laughs> huh? What do you think? Uh, I'll just roll whatever we got to do. See? I'm ready. There you go. Go for it. I am gone. No? <laughs> Not what you were hoping for? <laughs> well, we know Neil Kulong's here. At least we got that right now. All right, we'll talk to Neil then. Neil, how are you? It's great to be here as always. I I, uh, I have accidentally cut you off a couple times, but you have never cut me off. Well, I deserve to be cut off, and everybody knows it. So I think my cheek just pressed the end button. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's uh, get to Edmonds. Let's start there. Where does that stand, do you think, right now? Um, I Everything that I have heard surrounding Terrell Edmonds was there was always interest uh, from the Steelers on getting him back. Um, the, the the crazy thing with all this is you got to understand the uh, the fifth year option for players is the most artificially set uh, monetary device in the world. Yes. I mean, there, there's nothing tangible about it. It just right. is. It's the rule, um, and that's what they go with. It's not based on your playing value. And the Steelers, in, in my opinion, um, the Steelers have done. Um, well, it, with the exception of maybe Bud Dupree, but there were extenuating circumstances with that. In my opinion, they made the correct, correct decision with every option that they've given. This has been around since 2011 now. Right. Um, they've always made the right move with that. And in my opinion, uh, Terrell Edmonds, the decision on Terrell Edmonds at about $6.5 million a year for the, the, the fifth year was probably – uh, the, the toughest in terms of I could see this going either way. I really could. And I was not surprised they didn't pick it up. But it, it, I said at the time, it's not going to be because they don't value him as a player. The safety market is just crazy. It, it's, it's up in the air every year. You don't know who's going to get what, except for whatever reason, veterans who sign in free agency – at the safety position tend to not do particularly well. The top of the market are guys uh, being retained by their current teams. So I think the Steelers uh, said, and this has been a, a tried and true method for them. There are free agents that they say, look, we'll, we'll let you go. We won't tag you. Go into free agency, see what you can get. And, you know, if, if you're interested in playing here, let us know what that is and we'll, we'll let you know what we can do about it. Um, I, I feel that they did that. And I feel that in this particular uh, free agency market, what ended up happening was Tyron Matthew, who's probably going to be the free agent to, to set most of the market as far as the free agents go, um, he, he didn't sign right away. So you aren't really sure what other safeties are going to kind of you know look for in negotiations. But the, the Steelers, because they have uh, really the, the kind of line of demarcation, in that 50 year option amount, that 6.5 million, they have said, we don't value you at that. Here's our offer, which is probably under 6.5 million on a multi-year extension. Edmonds, I think wisely wanted to kind of wait and see and, and uh, for his side as well, see what Matthew is getting um, and then see what the availability looks like. 
you put all those things together, it's not surprising that it's gone um, a couple weeks into free agency now where Edmonds hasn't signed anywhere. But the revelation that um, he it, that, that Edmonds has an offer from the Steelers I don't think is, is really all that big of a deal just simply because they had a, a, a pretty set amount of what they were going to offer him. It's probably going to be five, five and a half million a year something like that on a long-term deal. And I think it, it's definitely wise of them to lock him up. I, I think he, he's a good player. Uh, they know him. That's not a big-time price, uh, especially when you've got your other safety kind of hanging in the wind right now for the same situation next year. Um, it, it would be, I, it, to me, the way they're building their team really looks to be in the secondary. They, they've signed more guys to play in the secondary, I think, than they ever have uh, at this point in an offseason. They have not uh, invested a ton draft-wise in names but they've acquired a bunch of different players um, who can play inside, outside cornerback, who might be able to fill in at safety along with special teams. They're going to keep probably nine defensive backs, maybe 10. It seems like that's the direction Mm -hmm. they want to go. And if that's the case, they've got to lock up a safety. I think Edmonds is is a good player at the right price uh, for them to be able to do that. So I I would imagine, uh, barring something with Matthew, I would imagine that Edmonds is going to come back. And I, I said that last year as well. I, I would not write off the idea of them uh, keeping him on a three- or four-year contract. All right. So I think I've seen a little bit of a pattern with what the Steelers are doing in that it seems like if you are 30 or under, they are willing to, to re-sign you. Uh, Witherspoon's a good good example, right? Joe Hayden's 33, so no. I mean, is that the pattern you're seeing as well? That it, you know, if you can, if if you're in your 20s, they will they will re-sign you. If you're over that 30 year year old mark, they really want to just kind of like go in a different direction. It, it seems that that's it, it. It's falling that way now. And I'll say this because I took some heat on this in in, in social media over it. Um, it almost seems like it's a premium now. Because let me ask you, when was the last time they retained a cornerback? and then sign two of them uh, in the free agency market. Three cornerbacks to go with the guy that they already have on extension, giving them four signed veteran cornerbacks. Mm-hmm. And it's still a position they might address in, in the draft as well. Right. Uh, the commonality with all those players is exactly as you said. They're young. Yeah. Um, Arthur Mallette, uh Witherspoon was a player that they picked up with via trade last year. Levi Wallace is, is a, a pure free agent, and Cam, uh, Cam Sutton is, is the extension. Um, these are it, it shows me that their philosophy as far as defensive backs is maturing and they're they're putting a little bit more money into it. I'm not saying that any of these guys are, are Jalen Ramsey. You know, they don't need to be twenty million dollar a year players. Right. But the fact is you need a lot of cornerbacks and just the way the game is played nowadays, there are not a whole lot of cornerbacks who are high level successful. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. There are half as many cornerbacks that make $17 million or more a year than there are wide receivers. These are obviously adversarial positions, and teams will stock probably the same amount on their roster, yet you're twice as likely to make that big, that premium, premium NFL-level money as a receiver as you are a cornerback. It just shows there are more, quote-unquote, good receivers then there are cornerbacks. I'd say that's more of a reflection of how the game is played nowadays. But the idea is you need to load up on cornerbacks at that kind of, you know, mid-level uh, price point for it. And Kevin Colbert has spoken about this for years. He's always said, young guys on cheap contracts. If we can get that, we will. I think the difference is, and this is what you're speaking to, um, they're signing them a lot earlier in the off season, mm-hmm. as opposed to Witherspoon with a trade acquisition last year uh, for pretty cheap. And they gave him a raise. Um, and they gave him the exact same amount of money that they did Levi Wallace. And I, I don't think that was a coincidence. I think they had it earmarked to sign one of, you know, somebody at that price. They, they wanted to get a $4 million deal over two years for a, a one cornerback. And I think they just said, you know what, let's just bring both in. Let's get deeper at the cornerback position with these younger veteran guys. Um, <clears throat> draft picks are at the cornerback position in particular. It is so volatile. It's really hard to tell where a player is going to be after two or three years. Everyone, every Steelers fan is going to immediately bring up Artie Burns. Well, you know, Artie right. Burns is still in the league. Artie Burns is still getting paid. There's mm-hmm. a reason for that. Yes. It, it's not easy to be a high level cornerback. 
Right. And because of that, unless you're taking, you know, Jalen Ramsey, it, it, it's really hard to project where any of them are going to be. So when you take one at 25, it, it's hard to say that there is um, a, a, a high level of probability at 25 as it would be at say 65 or what Colbert is doing in, in you know, the, the final free agency of his career is they're, they're signing guys in free agency who have proven something already who can be acquired at, at a reasonable price. And they're just going to build depth and they're going to run probably 6 billion sub packages this year, kind of similarly to what they did last mm-hmm. year. And all these guys are going to get on the field. I don't think any one of them are going to do anything that, that's going to be eye popping but they're going to have a very good secondary. And I, I think the, the depth of talent that they have there speaks to that. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, how, this is a wild card co- uh, question. Obviously, some people think the Steelers will try to go to get a wide receiver at some point in the draft. Um, and But there's a guy sitting out there. He doesn't turn 30 until November, and he's not coming off a good season. Would the Steelers have any interest in Jarvis Landry? Um. Choosing my words carefully here, I, uh, I would say the Steelers are going to have interest in any receiver at a certain price. Right. I think, and it, this this goes by what I deem to be some pretty masterful spin work by by Landry's representation in discussing um, how it really seemed to be a, a mutual decision on both sides to part ways. No, they didn't want to pay you what you were scheduled to be paid. So they right. went out and got Amari Cooper and didn't really pay him any less. Then they got rid of you. Um, I don't know how good or how valuable Jarvis Landry is anymore. I do think that Jarvis Landry, though, like I mentioned earlier in the segment, he, he's among that group of veteran players that might wait until after the draft to see what their best options are. Right. Um, and probably – what, what you, you eventually hit, you know, um, mercenary road as a receiver, you sign a, a series of one-year contracts in different places um, at that high-level mark, but nobody wants to, to invest in you long-term. Right. And again, it's because there are so many good receivers, and there are so many of them available at, at multiple levels throughout the draft. I mean, you've never heard of the school that Adam Thielen went to. Mm-hmm. Adam Thielen had a pretty good career. I yes. put his career up against Jarvis Landry's mm-hmm. any day. Agreed. Very easily. I mean, mm-hmm. there's a trust in the dependability in how Adam Thielen plays when he's healthy that coaches love and quarterbacks love. Yeah. I might say the same thing for Jarvis Landry, and he hasn't been healthy. So yeah. it, it, it doesn't take much for a receiver to kind of, you know, slow down if they don't have that size, if they don't have the, the physical attributes – to be able to go down the scene to wreak havoc as a combat catch type of guy, uh, Jarvis Landry is not a big guy. He requires you know speed and precision, precision, and with that comes timing with your quarterback. So you either want him for a couple of years to develop with somebody, or you, what's what's the value of him? I'm not sure the Steelers would say no uh, up to a certain price point, but Landry is, has clearly represented that he still feels he's worth that much money. Um, I, I get why he says that. I don't think there's anything objective. Uh, I don't think there's anything objective uh, for him to stand on to say that he's worth it. Right. Um, I watched him play last year. He's not the same guy. Not even no. close. And and Cleveland clearly feels the same way. So um, I I wouldn't imagine he's going to find a market for any higher than you know probably around what Juju got. And Juju mm-hmm. at least has the size factor in his advantage. Yeah. Um, Juju is also is pretty leveraged on what he's going to do within that offense he can earn up to 10 million i I imagine landry wouldn't have that many exceptions but um he's not going to earn more than than nine or ten i wouldn't think Mm -hmm. Um, the longer he waits on it too um the the less likely he is to to uh um to to be able to cash in it could be seven receivers taken in the first 40 picks yeah wouldn't surprise me at all it's happening more and more and these guys are better you can see that i'm sure with what you do i remember for me the, the gold standard was Odell Beckham. I right. watched Odell Beckham at LSU, and I was like, this is the greatest college receiver I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. They're not like this in college. He is so nuanced. He was so fluid. Um, they're all like him now. Yeah. You know, It wasn't long ago. I mean, it, 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 you know, this is LSU, and I'll, I'll admit I absolutely have loved the, the receivers that LSU has put into the NFL. But uh, Jefferson is, is, is a, a quintessential example of that. Mm-hmm. He went, what, 21st overall? Right. Like, you watch him. I'm like, wow, this, 
This guy was a top 10 pick 10 years ago. Right. You don't really have to train him to do anything. He's already doing it. He's yeah. a plug and play rookie. Um, that just wasn't heard of at the receiver position. So why am I going to pay money for Jarvis Landry? I, right. I don't see the point. He, he's a he's a target to eater, but he's not going to be a difference maker. I'm not going to pay a guy like that yeah. uh, as a mercenary. I see why Cleveland paid him. Leader, you're here. We want to build around you. And they did that. It's time for him to move on. I don't think that's going to happen to him again. Yeah, the reason I brought him up is that Emmanuel Sanders, for example, is 35, right? Uh, you look at Julio Jones, he's 33. A.J. Green's 34. He's the guy that's 29. So that's why I targeted him uh, as, okay, what do you think? Because I'm, I'm trying to use the 30-year-old part as a gauge. It just seems as that's where the Steelers are. Uh, yep, it's very true. It's very and, true. I mean, he's got a ton of targets, too. you got to keep that in mind. He's yeah. not just 29. I mean, you got to tack on another two seasons to his, right. his odometer. Right, yeah. yeah. He's had to do a lot of running. He's been hit. A lot, and you know, and that brings with it obviously wear and tear. I mean, that's part of the problem with Julio Jones: is a lot of wear and tear. Uh, and and you saw that with him badly last year. Yeah, he doesn't look at all no. the way he used and He's to look. got a lot of hamstring problems, as everybody knows. All right, so now we're starting to make the turn toward the draft. Here we are, just about three weeks away. Getting any gauge as to what they want to do with this thing? Uh, it, it, I don't think. I have felt less certain of how they're going to approach this in any other year. We're, we're coming off historic spending on their part, which, you know, partially due to the fact that they're not paying a quarterback uh, 20% of their cap anymore. Right. Um, just like, just like 7% of it or something, but they, um, they spent a lot of money. They are clearly overhauling everything. And we've talked about this in, in the past this was coming. In fact, I'd, I'd argue this was put into place last year. They started working toward this. They were going to have to transition. Um, with the money that they're spending in free agency, what they seem to be doing on defense, um, a, a completely new offensive line, I, I have no idea what they're going to do. And I think that's exactly the position they wanted to put themselves in this year after not being able to use the draft um, as a, a, a as a, a bolster for depth last year they had gotten fine starters and they i think they did a pretty good job of that i think they, they identified players who could come in and play for them to a reasonable level uh right away they don't have to do that this year and i think that's why they signed as many guys as they did that's why they're going to it seems anyway they're going to bring back terrell Edmonds more than more likely than not that's going to happen um they can draft more for the future now uh, as opposed to the present now they're not going to say that but it, it really just opens up everything that they want to do. And, I, you know, the obvious elephant in the room here is the fact that you have to legitimately think um, there will be a quarterback that they have spent a lot of time scouting, talking to, uh, probably available for them at 20. In the past, um, even last year, I wouldn't have said that was going to happen. It really seems like that's in play this year. And I, if they truly want to bring in four either paid starters or a high premium draft pick thought to be a starter within a year or two uh, in the camp, that's also unprecedented. They haven't done that, I don't know how long, you know, for, for obvious reasons, but they, they haven't brought in that much level of competition uh, at the quarterback position. You, you have to think um, that position's on the board in one or two. I, you know, you, you can't say that it isn't. So to me, it, all this does is really, it, it paints a picture that if they're going to let the draft come to them at 20, which I think is, is good because I don't think their roster has definitely improved. I don't think they're going to be, it, it's going to take a lot for them to be what they were last season, which was in my opinion, just, you know, tragically lucky somehow they won a lot of those games that they shouldn't have. They were not a, mm -hmm. a, a nine win level talent team. They grossly overachieved. Um, they can bolster on that this year. There, there's more that they can build, and I, I think they'll do a good job of that in this draft. But I, I really don't know uh, to, to say one direction is going to be more valuable than another. Um, I can see them going quarterback in round one because that might be the guy that they want. Mm -hmm. um, they wouldn't take a running back, I don't think. But beyond that, I'm not sure – we can really rule out any position in round one because I, I see a roster that nowadays they're signing players to, to two-year contracts, it seems only. So 
they're embracing the idea of rebuilding probably a little bit faster than they have in the past. So you draft a guy to, to play now or to play next year, it'll fit. It'll make sense. They, they could go any, any one of several directions. Well, we always go in the right direction when we have you on. So, sir, thank you so much. Absolutely. Appreciate it. Mm-hmm. When car repairs get difficult. Well, I, I just don't know. Um, Me neither. We get good. Sunbury Motors. More than quality new and used cars, Sunbury Motors specializes in complicated auto repair diagnosis. They can handle intricate repairs and even complete auto body with service open Monday through Friday, 7 till 4. And Sunbury Motors has made simple repairs easy. Maintaining your vehicle is necessary. Finding the time to do it is difficult. Welcome to Sunbury Motors Quick Lane. Open 7 till 4, Monday through Friday. Just walk in or call ahead. Relax in their remodeled waiting room with Wi-Fi, beverages, and snacks. Will Sunbury Motors factory train techs take care of your oil change, tire alignments, brakes, and inspections. Quick Lane, 6.30 to 6, Monday through Friday, Saturday, 6.30 till 2. Sunbury Motors, Ford and Hyundai, North 4th Street, Sunbury. And Sunbury Motors, Kia, routes 11 and 15 in Hummel's Wharf. We take the... Mm. Mm. Out of auto repair. Taking your calls at 800-795-9565. This is the Steve Jones Show on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Now from the Sunbury Motor Studio, here's Steve Jones. Todd McShay of has the Eagles taking a punter with the second first round pick. Kind of unusual. I don't know if I'd go that round. Um, yeah, that that would force me to uh, criticize one Howie Roseman. No, 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 no. You would not criticize him, not in the least, because the time it would take for you to get from here to CVS and back, the show might be over. Hmm. <laughs> That is a good point. <laughs> I mean, you would be, like, to the edge. Yeah, yeah. Not going to lie. I mean, you'd be, I mean, you would be to the edge. I mean, really, there would be an entertainment value to it. It's like watching the suit tee off on nine over at the Susquehanna Valley Country Club. There's an entertainment value to it. F-O-U-L-E-D, that spells foul Thought I'd mention it. <laughs> Interested to see like how it does with now. What what picks do they have? They have what fifteen and what? Fifteen 18? and eighteen now for this year. And the Saints have sixteen and nineteen? Correct. Okay. So they're still in front of the Saints in both. Right, but the Saints moved up two spots technically from because they had eighteen. So they moved up from 18 to 16, kept 19. Eagles got gave up 16 and 19, got 18 back, essentially. When it just those in terms of those picks. Oh wow! I now I know why you think it's a steal. Today's show brought to you by our good friends at Sunbury Motors, Fourth Street in Sunbury. Sunbury Motors Kia, or it's eleven and fifteen Humble's Wharf. Online at sunburymotors dot com for Kia Hyundai. Oh, what's that about? Tell me, it's a test. It probably is, but I'd like to know the same thing. Ford, Kia, Hyundai, best in new inventory, great pre-owned inventory with the Sunbury Motors guarantee, and a great service department that takes care of everything. They take care of inspections, routine, diagnostics. They handle it all. All at Sunbury Motors, 4th Street in Sunbury. Sunbury Motors, Kia, Routes 11 and 15, Hummel's Wharf online at sunburymotors.com. Tiger Woods says he's going to give it a shot. He's going to try and play at the Masters. He feels the 27 holes he has played so far and the recovery he's had from those respective rounds open the door for him to give it a shot. Uh, he is in the field. Uh, Louis Oosthuizen and I think Neiman are the uh, Joaquin Neiman are his two playing partners for the uh, Masters, and they're in the ten to eleven o'clock range, I do believe. Yep, ten thirty-four to be exact. 
Oh, for somebody that's not interested, you seem to know. I just happened to see it. You'll watch. Oh, yeah, I'm going to watch. Oh, I thought you didn't want him in the field. Well, no, I didn't want him in the field, but I'm still going to watch. Oh, oh. I'm gonna, so I'm going to I'm so in the, the, I'm in the watch it, to it, see if he fails it, and how long he lasts. I you know, it's typical Philadelphia attitude about everything. <laughs> I will, want to see others fail. I will be even your own team. <laughs> I'll never, I mean, I'll never forget that Nets game as long as I live. The doggone, they're playing the doggone Nets, and Simmons comes out, and they boo him, and at the end of the game, the Nets are winning, and they booed the Sixers. <laughs> this is your, this is, these are your people. I don't care if he's played 100 rounds, 100 holes of a practice, 100 practice holes. I will still be surprised if he makes it one eighteen rounds, uh, eight one round eighteen hole of golf. I will be surprised. I think he'll. I think he gets to the weekend. Tiger Woods began the day at fifty to one, and then it went to forty five to one. Now it's forty to one. John Rahm said, quote, you can feel it. A lot of it is Tiger because I was playing with Tony Finau on the front nine Monday. We were about four or five holes ahead. We were on seven, and they were walking down on two. I've never seen a mass this big for a practice round on Monday on those two holes. And you hate it. Because we're given a guy that basically all, that brought all the turmoil that he's been through on himself because of selfish, dumb decisions. And now we're giving so, him all so, the spotlight so that, oh my God, he's coming back. So you say his, his back problems, from which he's had four back surgeries, were all his fault. His knee surgery in 2008 was his fault. Okay, minus the health concerns that he's had. Yeah, but you just said all everything. Yeah. It's like... I mean, I you know, you hate I remember things. I understand that. <laughs> Bryson Stott. And um, and Alec Bohm are going to make the Phillies roster. So I wanted to point that out. Meanwhile, Bobby Witt Jr. with Kansas City, Spencer Torkelson with the Tigers, and Rodriguez with the uh, Mariners, all top prospects. Guess what they're going to be doing? They all made their opening day roster. They are not going to be held back in the minors because of service time. I mean, guess what? Uh, young um, players playing right out of the gate because you have, I mean, the teams care about their fans. And teams care about their fans. So they're going to they're gonna play. Meanwhile, the Pirates are sending all their guys down. Like, well, what are you doing? You're not going anywhere. Let them play. Let the people get excited about somebody. Come on. You know, the Pirates last year averaged 10,000 a game. In all fairness, in April and in May last year, they the number was reduced because of COVID. But from June 1st on, they were allowed to have full houses. They averaged 10,000. I'm surprised the they Al even made it to 10,000. <laughs> The Altoona curve averaged 4,400 last year. And there may be a couple of nights this year where Altoona, where they've got a lot of prospects, by the way. The Pirates have a lot of prospects at Altoona this year. 
Altoona might outdraw the Pirates on certain nights, even though the ballpark only seats 7,200. I mean, that's amazing. The Phillies, what they're doing with their group, it is obvious what the Phillies are doing. The Phillies have looked at their bullpen and said, you know what, we need to outscore people. We need to put up a lot of runs. And there is an excitement about that, that Harper now has Castellanos. Harper now has, um, you know, they've got JT Real Muto. And Harper now has... Um, um, the kid they got from the Red Sox who's with the Kyle Schwarber. Okay? I mean, that offense is exciting. That draws people in. That gets people going as to what they can possibly do. All right? um, and they know the pitching is going to be a problem, but scoring a lot of runs is really, really exciting. Really exciting. And I think they understand who they are, and they understand how they need to go about getting it done. They know they're not going to have great pitching. Okay? So since they know that they don't have great pitching, they are going to now go about it like we're going to score as many runs as we can, and we're going to get some days where they have really good pitching. There are going to be some days that that happens. But we all know the bullpen is going to be a mixed bag for them, and it becomes less of a factor if you're already out there with an 8-2 to two lead. And they get it. Meanwhile, the Pirates are interesting. By the way, Sportsbook lists them their win total over-under of 65.5, which is tied with the Orioles and the Diamondbacks. But when it comes to attendance, they averaged 10,611 last year. It is not going to get better this year. Altoona averaged 4,032 last year. The curve might end up being a tougher ticket because they've got Quinn Priester, Mike Burroughs, uh, Pagaro, Nick Gonzalez, all on it. It's a pretty talented roster they've got there. But if you're Bob Nutting... He bought the Pirates for $95 million in 1996. According to Forbes, let me ask you, what is the estimated value of the franchise right now, Matt, if you had to guess? He bought it for $95 million. How much do you think the estimated value is, according to Forbes, of the Pittsburgh Pirates in 2022? And he bought it at what? $95 million. $95 million. I would say the current value is... Twenty-five million. One point three two billion dollars. What? According to Forbes. How? How? First of all, it's a major league baseball franchise. Oh, well, that's true. Right? But let me go through the list as to why. It's a major league baseball franchise. The ballpark is worth a lot in terms of the location of it, the land, the view of the city, the condition it's in. I think Citizens Bank Park is a great park. I think if I had a choice between the two, it's close, because I think Citizens Bank is tremendous. I like PNC a little bit more, but that's only a personal preference. If a Philly fan said to me, oh, come on, Citizens Bank's better, I'd be like, hey, that's fine. I understand that, because I think Citizens Bank is a great ballpark. I love going there. Something about PNC to me is just a little bit better, but that's just personal preference. I actually it's agree not, with that. I mean, but it's not like it's like one of those like you know, one way or the other you end up with a winner. They're both great, okay. But because of all those factors, you're a major league baseball team. Even though the even though the population in Pittsburgh did decline in the last five years, I mean the the population in the city has declined. It's one of the cities in the country that has seen the last five years, especially with the pandemic, a decline in population. But it's a major league franchise with a great ballpark on valuable land and everything that goes with it. You know, the TV contracts are good. The radio contracts are good. They're not great, but they're good. But according to Forbes, that if the Pirates were up for sale, 
the value would be $1.32 billion. So if Bob Nutting sells it, and he sells it for, for the value, he's looking at a $1.2 billion windfall. Isn't that unreal? Sounds like to me he should just do it since it doesn't. he doesn't really seem to care. Yeah, but, you know, there are a lot of people who like the prestige of owning a ball club or owning a team of some sort. And, or you think that's amazing because if you're just – when it comes to the value of a ball club or the value of a franchise, you can't just look at the record. There's, there's a lot of factors that go into it. Uh, we'll wrap it up in a moment on News Radio 1070 WKOK. Fan base has been extraordinary. We're so excited for you. And here to present the trophy is the head of the basketball committee, Tom Burnett, to, to coach Self and the Kansas City Jayhawks, the University of Kansas Jayhawks. Get the lingerie on the deck. Call the janitor. No words. <laughs> I think it speaks for itself. It just keeps, it's just a, ongoing and going. <laughs> the Miami Marlins are the only major league franchise under a billion. Their value is $990 million. And then Tampa Bay is at $1.1. The Pirates are the 23rd most valuable major league franchise at $1.32 billion. Their, their valuation is up 3% from last year. Okay. The, the Pirates actually made $64 million. If you can believe that. $64 million that they made. And their debt is uh, 11%. Uh, The Phillies are number eight. The Phillies' value is $2.3 billion. That's up 12% from last year. The debt is 6%. They lost $17 million. The number one franchise, your New York Yankees. They're worth $6 billion. That's up 14% from last year. There's no debt, but the Yankees lost $40 million last year. Dodgers lost $8 million. The Red Sox made $69 million. The Cubs made $68 million. The Giants made $32 million. The Mets lost $96 million. Cardinals lost 34 million, the Phillies lost 17, the Angels 2.4, the Braves made 83 million, the Rangers made 97 million.